and being banned. So they decide they're not even going to deal with it. You know, it's just uh, that was part of this shield comp. I actually I was surprised <laughs> the the day uh, when we saw the shield comp. I was taking a look at those vods mm -hmm. and uh, TPA not running kind of their standards, you know, stuff. They, it seemed that, I mean, the shield comp, with the Jarvan and everything like that, it's an early game strategy, you know, early to mid game. It is incredibly powerful. It's like kind of an all-in strategy where you're looking yeah. for those early kills into Snowball, and that's exactly what happened. But TPA, we usually see really nice defensive play from them, primarily out of toys. But instead of taking a Nivea, who's one of his best champions and was open in that game, uh, he actually took Rise. And, you know, they had a couple of interesting picks. Um, and so they, they actually fell behind early and Karma mid actually did uh, a number on Rise. So, um, you know, Anivia and uh, Oriana both being banned out this game, but TPA, they're going to be perfectly happy with that <laughs> Diana pick. It's the lock Diana. We've seen that again in every single uh, but one game in this tournament here. Someone is either banned or usually insta-locked Diana here. Uh, we saw it to great effect with uh, Team Solomid against Azubu Blaze with a great initiation combo she has. But she's been, really been picked a lot for, for a couple of reasons. One is that her laning phase actually works very well in, in almost any matchup. You know, she's safe enough, you give her the blue buff and she's got shields to kind of stop harass. You can kind of turn on aggressively if you really need to and kind of fight out. And also she's one of the very few true good initiators in League of yeah. Legends. Uh, you've got champions like Leona, Ash, Malphite. There's champions in various roles that are good initiators that are that are dedicated initi initiators. You know, something like Wall of Pain from Karthus or Cho'Gath Rupture, you can evade those and not care yeah. too much. But if you Lunar Rush into Moonfall, that guy got caught. If you Solar Flare, that guy got caught. So and getting that initiation is really important. And that's what we've seen from a lot of teams is the fact that Diana perfectly sets up later team fights. But it's not just the fact that she has those really strong team fights. It's her early game is unbelievable. And like you said, she doesn't lose lane to anyone, but she has really high base stats. You know, you, you can very early in the game be so tanky that teams yeah. struggle to take you down, uh, which allows Diana to roam a lot and allows her to, you know, fight in the jungle uh, particularly well and allow her team to come back around. Up. So, um, just an all-around strong pick. TPA also going with Lulu, and we we saw all this weekend how incredible Lulu's been. Mundo also one of Lil Balls' favorite, but uh, Olaf on the other side for SGS, and actually Olaf is uh, one of my favorite champions right now. Um, I think he's you know, just incredibly strong in the top lane or jungle. It, it opens up a, opens up a lot of options for them in general. Now they they have locked in Nocturne, so they are um, completely showing. That, that, that solo lane Olaf. The thing is, with the insta-lock Taric against Diana, that reads to me as Singapore Sentinels went in a 2v1 mid lane. Because mm -hmm. normally Taric, right, he's not a highly contested support. And that's, support. that's something that we see a lot in yeah. uh, in that region, is a lot of people go for those 2v1s. Bit. Yeah, the Asians really run that stuff. We actually saw um, uh, TPA themselves ran it with the solo right. bottom Karthus against M5 BenQ. Uh, and, and this is the kind of thing that these guys will run. And I'm curious if TPA has read that. Because again, the early Taric is very, very surprising. Yeah. But it's like, well, particularly well, with Vayne. Because oh, exactly. It's not then really it makes it lane. more of a kill lane as opposed to, um, you know, usually you want someone with, you know, really great presence with Vayne. And Taric definitely has that. Yeah, Vayne's not the kind of guy who wants to fight all that much early on. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see how this ends up panning out. We know Olaf's going to be on Equivocal here. We know Darkness is going to be on Nocturne, which is very fitting, by the way. I like that. Um, he's managed to fit the champion well. LY4 uh, going to be on Vayne. And they've still actually yet to pick their AP mid. And I think it's because, again, they know he's going to be against a 2v1. They're going to run that lane swap there. He's going to be facing up against Lulu Corky. And they're going to insta-lock that as Gragas. And Gragas I like a lot here, actually. Um, because I, I feel like he actually could face off well against Diana. If Diana goes in melee range, he gets an easy uh, barrel, barrel, and body slam. Yeah. But also, he's a great one versus two. He's got innate sustain both on health and mana. He'll be able to farm from range, and he can escape ganks really well with that body slam. So that's my prediction for the champions. Um, James, what do you feel about the actual lineups here, the five on fives? Well, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. I, I, a lot of it's going to come down to early game pressure. And Mundo, his pressure all comes in the jungle. He, as a jungler, he's one of the best early fighters because his base damage is so high and he's incredibly tanky early on. But he can't put a lot of pressure on that mid lane. And so like you were saying with that Gragas pick, uh, not only can Gragas potentially put some pressure on Diana or you know, at the very least be safe in that lane, Mundo is not really going to do much against uh, Gragas in that situation. Usually uh, Gragas is going to be able to get away from Mundo pressure. Um, so then you compare that with Nocturne. So Lil Balls, he's, he's pretty primarily looking to uh, counter jungle and then put pressure on the side lanes. Uh, Nocturne, on the other hand, after he gets a couple of levels, you know, they could pick up some quick kills, um, you know, try and snowball this game early on. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see if they can do that. But as the team fights progress later on, uh, you always have to consider, you know, the AD versus AD matchup. And 
Diana, or uh, sorry, Vayne, one of the strongest ADs in the game right now. If you can play her effectively, then in my opinion, she's the best AD in the game. And I'm sure a lot of people agree with that. You know, she, it's, she's, she's just really insanely so strong. strong. Yeah, BB ran her a lot at the World Finals. Uh, yeah. You know, they lost game one against uh, Rapid Stars Karthus primarily, but uh, yeah, it's a champion that they've been running, generally speaking, a whole heck of a lot throughout uh, their competitive careers. And, and you're right, right? She, she has the potential to be the best AD carry in the game because you can play... Uh, if you can play safely enough and not get caught out, you're putting out the most damage, but you're arguably the most safe with Tumble. That's exactly the issue, though, is not getting caught out. And she yeah. has to deal with Diana and Shen. And mm -hmm. so if Shen gets off to a good start, you know, or he just uh, ults in with Diana, then that could be really dangerous for them in fights. But yeah. uh, Tarek and Gragas can give them some separation there. Uh, and then, you know, they will potentially have enough burst damage to just instantly kill Diana in those fights. And that's one of the strengths of Gragas, is the fact that, you know, he can really provide that separation for Vayne. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty important overall. Um, so, so the difficulty as well, though, is, is I want to keep talking about how scary this is for Vayne, because I think it's a very important point to talk about. Probably the most high-impact champion we'll see this game will be Vayne. She tends to make uh, a big spectacle of everything she does. Uh, that almost, was key for the Fnatic TPA games that oh, yeah. you know, we saw earlier. Reckless was amazing. Uh, but the difficulty I see here for LY4 on Vayne is that everyone on TPA can pretty much dive in, even Lulu with Glitterlands. But here comes at a crazy 5-5 five five up to start out. Yeah, they get the cleave onto Equivocal. He's going to be able to back out of there, but uh, their level one is particularly strong. And, you know, if, if they're uh, grouped up, then they can take advantage. Uh, they don't have to deal with the Taric uh, because they can all clump up in the bushes now. So they've zoned SGS out of this jungle, which means the SGS isn't going to be able to come in and fight them. But TPA actually just warding and backing off. So, you know, just comfortable. They don't want to stick around too long. They always want to kind of, you know, have flash in the pan uh, strikes where, you know, they, they catch their enemies off guard. Oh, this is so good for TPA, though, because, I mean, everyone on that team is great at level one. Yeah. They literally either all have an area of effect spell or a great poke. And and, uh, and, and are fairly tanky as oh, a team, yeah. so they're not going to get burst down. They can cycle out in fights partic uh, particularly well. Yeah, and they're still just, like, running on forward. You can see them face-checking everything. Cleaver lands on the Hallelujah. And I think they're just going for another Wraith Ward here, because they're not diving in hardcore for a fight. You can see Diana using that Crescent Strike to check that upper brush, make sure they're not running into kind of a, a weird flanking position. And, like, you know what? It's okay. They warded the blue buff, and they're just going to simply take their own and then move on from there. And it's interesting to me, I, I was just kind of thinking about it, and we were talking about it some earlier, SGS, some of the team changes that they've had. Because, you know, Tofu Boy, he was their top lane. He was very strong and had a big relationship with Chai. But uh, we'll actually get back to that in a second, because SGS making their way in. They're going to try for this invade on TPA, and TPA doesn't oh. seem ready for it, but Toys, the perfect Crescent Strike, able to check, it, uh, check them out and get an eye on them. <laughs> SGS, they might be able to steal this blue, though. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you oh, and they see steal that it's the bot top lane, so they're ready for that. Yeah. So, so, so Stanley's already run down towards the bottom. I don't see this fight going well for them at all. They actually have sent Gragas mid, so bad call on my part. Uh, and there's no smite here available for TPA, so an easy grab here for Darkness on oh, Nocturne. Baby gets so away. much damage on Tarek and Nocturne, forcing him back. So that could slow them down a little bit. I'm not too worried for Nocturne. I think because yeah, right. his entire jungle is here. He can take all the smaller camps and kind of sustain back up. But uh, yeah, they're actually running pretty much a standard setup here. Olaf's running down to 1v1 Shen and the 2v2 here. BB and Mistake going to take on Harleluya and LY4. And it's interesting though, SGS, they're a little bit behind because of the lane swap, but because they all went in for that blue invade, uh, they are you know they were aware of it at the very least. And I think they originally intended to send Olaf top. Otherwise, we might have seen, you know, maybe a blue from Olaf. And, uh, you know, since they were going for the invade, they could have secured both blues. And then Olaf with blue is unstoppable in lane. Like, you just can't beat him. But Mundo Lilballs, he's actually going for an invade now. They do have the ward over there, but he actually walked past a ward of SGS's. But uh, because the bot lane is top, they should be okay. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Kill top, baby low as well. Nocturne coming in, he's able to grab Lulu. Now, that's mistake going in. Equivocal is gonna find Lil Balls trying to chase him out here. Stanley is is someone he can run to. Lil Balls still trying to run away. Another, there's the Undertow as well. One hit. Oh, oh the my moon God. Ball. Would you believe that? And Equivocal. She's gonna run right away from that one. Lil Balls just barely surviving. No summoners left up. Wow, toys, hell of a play to get them out of there. I'll apologize, freak. That was probably me pulling you off that, uh, <laughs> that camera there. I'm, okay. I'm just like, you know, tugging at your jacket here, but uh, SGS has a nice lead in that top lane, and in particular, Vayne got the kill. Early kills on Vayne can, like, spell doom for any team. So if, if Vayne gets, you know, 2 0, 3 0, or something like that, that could be it for TPA almost. I mean, that's like, it's it's brutal to give up any of those early leads. I mean, you're absolutely right. This is, this is really, really good off the start for Singapore Sentinels. You know, I was. Talking a little bit of smack on that, that Tarek Vayne lane, yeah. they, you know, it doesn't make much sense, but when the Nocturne gank came in, that's the only extra damage they needed. Tarek 
is really, really good at making fights happen and making deaths happen. He's got a point and click and stun, and it worked really, really well. And I guess one of the things is it's it's similar to the vein blitzcrank lane that you know we see a lot of people do. It has that uh, quick kill potential, but mm -hmm. Tarek has a little bit more lane presence than blitzcrank does early on. Yeah, you know he can force fights on himself that where he's tanking and he's incredibly tanky early on that allow Vayne to be safe in that uh, top lane. Oh, a nice attempt. They're trying to get the pullback onto Chowie. Not quite a range of Moonfall, though, so no gank coming in here. But you can see the lane's kind of trying to go back together here. And I want to kind of recap how everything's going. It's 21 to 15 minions up in the top lane. Equivocal. Oh, Nocturne top again. They could maybe get this. Yeah, he is waiting around, sneaking through the brush here. Again, the lane's going to push down, so he's simply going to wait for it to push. And if BB and Mistake don't read this, they're going to walk into a very bad situation. You can see Dr. Moon trying to show up to make it a 3v3. And the ward for Mistake, he's going to spot Darkness. Yeah, so really nice wards. Mistake, he also had a ward down for Tarek uh, from the river, so not allowing him to get in, uh, involved there. But uh, Mundo coming up, and Mundo's one of the kings of counter-initiation early on. If Nocturne forces this fight, then Mundo has the damage early on where he can easily win that. Stanley pulling Equivocal back into the turret takes a ton of damage shots. coming off of those turret shots. That's incredible. That, that's a really, really good move right there. It's one of the great things that Shen and great Shen players can do in the laning phase is pull turret aggro on their opponents. You know, Shadow Dash itself does a little bit of damage, but the, the whole point is to taunt someone in turret range, which will, which will apply the call for help, and then, bam, there's a bunch of free damage for you. But at the same time, I'm kind of surprised Stanley, is, he's behind in that bottom lane. And that's considering that Olaf came to the lane late. So that's Olaf fair. came late, Stanley had some free time, and, uh, you know, Shen generally, you know, strong enough to win that matchup in the early levels, though Olaf definitely, as he uh, gets a couple levels, skills really well. The one thing that, that Equivocal is doing a whole heck of a lot is actually pushing hardcore with Undertow and, and expecting the jungler lowballs not to show up too much. Uh, and, and while Shred is characteristically a good last hitter at turrets, you'll still tend to lose a couple that way. Darkness coming down for a gank at bottom. Yeah, and uh, like you said, expecting uh, maybe little balls not to show up. And part of that is that Mundo, if you don't land the cleave, then you know you're not going to be able to uh, get a successful gank there. And so Olaf with the ghost, if uh, Mundo does show up, and if you know, like you said, he's not expecting him, he can just ghost out of there, dodge one cleave, and he's perfectly fine. So yep. um, you know he's he's going to be pretty comfortable in that bottom lane. But we'll see how that continues. Both mids farming right now, but a slight lead for toys. So you know he's able to pull ahead a little bit there. But a as these guys both hit six. Uh, have just hit six. Once they get some mana back in their system, uh, we could see a lot of quick aggression from them, or even roaming from both of those mids, since they're you know really common in uh, Gragas and Diana. Yeah, you're right. They are both roam-focused uh, mids. They're both actually itemizing. I should take the back. So Toys is itemizing for the lane. He's buying the, the first piece, the Negatron Cloak. He's yeah. building up towards the Abyssal Scepter. He's going to pretty much take no harassment from Chawi now on Gragas anymore. And he's going to be got incredibly tanky in, yeah. in those small skirmishes. Right yeah, now. he's got really nothing to fear right now. On the other side, though, Chawi, he's immediately rushed to Sorcerer's Shoes to go with that Doran's Ring. That's the kind of build where I actually do expect Rome. Like, you know, the early movement speed, the early magic pen, that's going to help him kill side lanes. Yeah, he's definitely looking to pick up kills, but one of the concerns is that TPA is one of the best teams in the world at that defensive play, if not the best team. Uh, Toys, he's very effective about moving out of the mid lane. Nocturne coming in, trying to steal that blue potentially, but Lulu and Mundo are there to uh, check him out, so uh, they actually zone him off of that, and they're going to be able to secure this. But um, they do TPA, have a ward, though. He could smite Yeah, that's it. true. He could smite steal. But TPA Toys, he's very effective at leaving the mid lane and uh, responding. He's a very reactive player to you know enemy team's aggression. And then the best thing about TPA is that the rest of their team, they, they transition very well and uh, move into that mid lane behind them. So they're always ready for a fight early on. Wow, the ping's going off. You just saw, actually, right here, uh, you saw TPA just ping that upper jungle, predicting exactly where Nocturne was. They actually got him spot on. They knew he was by the Wraith camp. But that that's one of the things I want to point out about top teams, is they actually will, will not chart at, but they will track which side of the map the jungler is on. He's on top jungle. Okay, top lane and mid lane, be careful. He's on bottom jungle. Okay, bottom lane, be careful. And they kind of know when they can play aggressively, when they can play defensively, because they'll track where the gangs yeah. are coming from. It's a really, really good move to make. And that's that's something, like, if you watch any of the top uh, laners in the world, uh, you'll see a lot of times, I, like I've seen games with Mac Noon, where he'll hide in the bushes and just, you know, not do anything, just extremely passive play. Then the second he sees the enemy jungler, he just all out aggression, goes in for a kill, or just to force him in lane. Like, blows all of his summoners and everything, just goes for it. But uh -oh. Diana, Toys, coming up in this top lane, he wants to set something up. He's very strong right now. And he made the move. Gragas is not quite following him out there. Actually completely, completely whiffs the Crescent Strike. That's not going to give him anything here. Yeah, and with the stun and then being underneath the turret, that would have been a hard follow-up as well. 
But um, you know, he's he's in a great situation because he's actually been bullying around Choi a little bit. He's been forcing Choi uh, to spam his spells to farm, and uh, you know, he's been kind of pushing him back a little bit. So if, if he can put pressure on that mid lane in particular, like you said, with that early mid uh, mid lane build, yeah, then you know that could completely shut down Gragas in this early game and allow TPA to get back into this. Yeah, well, Choi is now back is into pretty much full farm mode. He's got the second Doran's ring out, which is pretty much where he's going to sit at as far as items are concerned, mm -hmm. and and either just spam it that abyssal scepter. Or just rush for the death cap. Those are going to be probably his, his you know, his next for, his next one buys one of those two uh, yeah. items here. And, and now he's now he's in farm mode because it's a big item he needs next. So he's going to you know get all his gold going in. Uh, but on the flip side, though, we're seeing towards order to get one of those big pieces. He's going to be a lot more active, I feel. But really nice play from SGS. So taking advantage of the lane swap, they move down with Vayne and Tarek, and perfect timing with darkness. And so uh, you know they hit at the same time as he does. They're able to grab that dragon before TP8 has a chance to respond and equivocal he can go back in that top lane uh, and you know continue to do his thing but um, you know that's going to be a nice little goal lead and the, the later they can get or the deeper they can get Bane into her build the better and better chance TPA is going to have and and this is really interesting too because uh, oh, oh, almost he gets one he gets one wraith all right nice job toys uh, and, and that's one of the one of the cool things of course you can do is just lob shots over the wall and hope you hit something yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, both teams swapping back down. They tried to give Vayne's uh, a free lane. She's not getting that though. BB mistake, constantly pushing her down. But both junglers are here, so they're they're uh, setting up. Nocturne might come in, and Lil Balls, he's expecting him. Toys is on this half on this half of the map as well. He's actually looping well, well around, trying to actually dodge the ward that's right here, and he's going to. He's going to be able to knock his spot as he comes down. Finds darkness. Darkness turns on this one, and here's Hallelujah. Hallelujah, getting pretty low. Lila actually knocking Toys back into the wall. Toys is dropping very quickly. He gets the flash, but darkness takes. Him down and TPA mistake. He's way out of position right now. We'll see if he can get back to his team. He's got nowhere to run to. He, he, I mean, he will ult and run back through the turret, but the turret's not shooting anything. It's gonna hit mistake as well. He's gonna fall down. Hallelujah, unfortunately, gets the kill. But Singapore Sentinels are making every proper map move here. Yeah, and I, I don't know if that Tarek stun was necessary because I think Vayne would have picked that up. And then, you know, you're looking at a 2-0 Vayne. Maybe, you know, Vayne could have gotten the other kill as well. But um, really nice play from SGS in that situation. Uh, you know, Toys getting a little bit careless. And we saw against Fnatic, it's actually very similar to what happened in the Fnatic game. Was uh, They were playing against Vayne in game one, and they were trying to be the aggressors. And TPA is one of the best defensive teams in the world, but they were trying to force fights against Fnatic, mm -hmm. and then Fnatic outplayed them underneath yep. the turrets. They would you know, pick up the early kills onto Cat Arena, pick up early kills onto Vayne, and then use those to snowball them through that game. And it's, it's hilarious, too, because you know, you, you're looking at what TPA thought would have been a nice sort of 4v2 stand Lee had his ultimate, so a 5v2 if they, if they needed it. Uh, and you notice that, you know, Chawi didn't show up. I mean, that was that was everything but darkness was was everything they expected to be there. Uh, but the problem is Nocturne was already sitting in that brush waiting to counter gank, and he spotted out Toys. And the beautiful thing about that was, again, Toys took this route. He yeah. went up through the jungle here and never was spotted by a war. You look at the vision, they wouldn't have seen him. Yeah. They read his mind. Chawi called, he's MAA, he's coming to gank you. They guessed the bottom lane, that was correct. Even in Fog of War, they're like, he's here now. And Darkness walked forward and picked him up. And then Toys, overestimating his own tankiness early on, he just decided to fight it. So he saw Nocturne, he knew the bot lane was there, and they just bursted him down really quickly. He could have escaped uh, before fighting, but he decided to jump in, uh, yeah, thinking he, his team would back him up. But they actually, minions hadn't hit the turret yet, which meant that they weren't able to join him. Exactly. And now Toys, he's actually trying to secure his blue, but SGS with that early lead, uh, they're going to you know maybe look to take this. Well, they're still troubled here a little bit. They're actually pulling their bottom lane over to make that happen. If they can buy enough time against low balls, and actually, they have. They're not even hardly trying this right here. I take the back. Stanley's coming down. SGS really could steal away this blue. The difficulty for them was they had zero wards to put down, so they couldn't spot this golem buff. They didn't want to invade the jungle with no vision, but that, like, SGS straight up could have stolen away that golem if they just had a ward to put down to feel safer. Yeah, and a little bit of hesitation. They also saw that bot lane was pushing into them, and so they're kind of like, all right, well, you know, safe play right now. Let's just go back farm. You know, we, we won't force a fight uh, that maybe turns around against them. So still a little bit of fear. I mean, TPA is, you know, one of the strongest teams in the world. They've been playing them for a year now. So, mm -hmm. you know, they know everything about this team. But, uh, you know, it should be interesting to see what's going on. Generally speaking, Tarek or Corky and Lulu do very well versus uh, Tarek and Vayne. 
Um, you know, Corky, the Valkyrie completely negates Tarek's stun. Yep. And so uh, usually, you know, Vayne or Lulu can have enough lane presence and then Corky can have enough lane presence to shut down Vayne. But with these early kills, um, you know, he's doing pretty well for himself. Though you do see Bebe does have a nice CS lead. Yeah, and that, and that is, you know, that lane being, being incredibly awesome. But here comes Darkness, actually does find little balls. He will flash over the wall and nullify and that near tether. Gonna find Toys. Toys gets the channel. The shield is on. And that will keep him alive enough. Stanley not gonna land the taunt. Everyone else running backwards here. SGS going to disengage successfully. But they did manage to burn a flash. They managed to burn Stanley's ultimate. They did lose one flash of their own. Yeah, so Stanley uh, leaving lane a little bit. It, it looked like they almost might be able to pick up Darkness there, but he gets over the wall just in time. And you see SGS, they're looking to abuse that mid lane jungle synergy and the burst damage that they have. So, um, you know, every single time those ultimates are up, they're going to be looking for kills. But one of the concerns for SGS is going to be how is Equivocal going to get in this game? Because he, you know, he's new for their top lane. He was their support previously uh, for SGS. But with a pretty nice gold lead over TPA or, or over Stanley, and then also with the dragon and everything, he's going to be tanky very early in the game, and then Olaf's base damage in fights to go with that tankiness mm -hmm. is just insane. Honestly, I really like what Equivocal's done so far, and SGS in general. So, Equivocal went double gold per 10 onto Olaf. You can see he's up 16 minions on his lane opponent here, and he's got just, he's just starting to bank this, right? He's investing in himself. 56 gold from the Heart of Gold, 230 from the Philosopher's Stone. He's becoming rich. You can see he's at 4,500 to 3,600 on the other side. So, Equivocal is just by far ahead, and he's going to want to keep snowballing. This is one of the things that's really good for SGS, is they want to deny the split push here from Stanley. That's one of the best things that Shen will do for you, is, is run into a lane by himself and pull opponents away. The fact that Equivocal is ahead of him means that Equivocal will always stop that split yeah. push. He can shut the minions back down and, and you know reverse all that action from, from Taipei Assassins, and that just removes one of the options that TPA would have to hold the game out. And now with that early lead, that uh, true damage is really doing work on Shen and that lane. Generally speaking, Shen's going to be tanky enough. He's just going to kind of hang out. But, um, you know, we'll see how that lane kind of progresses. If Equivocal can actually start to shut Stanley out of that lane, which could kind of shut down any split push potential that they would have early on. Mistake with the quick flash after the stun, but Gragas is here as well. Trying to force the fight. There's the Gragas barrel. Can Mistake get out? He throws off his ultimate, but it doesn't look very good for him right now. Baby as well turning around. Can he get Lila? But he drops. Lila could pick up a couple of kills here. Double kill, and Lil Ball's trying to come in. But oh my god, Lila, he's 3 0 right now. And he's going to push back Lil Balls. Toys is coming in, though. This could be a great fight. He's going to find Lila. And here comes the battle, though. Darkness follows suit. Lil Balls down below half health. His ult is gone. Lila's uh, going to keep chasing in. Toys, he's going to find one. He's going to pick up that vein and now to run away. I don't know if he can do it. It's one versus three. Puts a lot of damage out with the Q. He is going to back out, but still a three for one. Rather good trade. Yeah, so he shuts down Vayne, but the damage was done. Vayne got a number of kills, and then Little Balls, he lost his oracles. That is devastating for TPA right now. It's a 3k gold lead, but it's actually worse than it seems right now because Vayne is incredibly farmed. She has that Phantom Dancer. She's going to just be pumping out a lot of damage. And then Little Balls, he's a little bit behind losing that oracles. He probably won't be able to pick up another one, which means they're going to lose some of that map presence that they've had. And so far, SGS has been perfectly countering out any sort of plays that TPA would make, and then making them themselves and this is this is really awesome in general because you look at a lot of things had to come together for that one so first of all you got to say as far as the two on two is concerned Lila is losing lane he's down about 30 minions he's been bullied out a whole heck of a lot it's been a rough situation the problem is is Chawi had a really really good gank there darkness on Nocturne I mean you can tell SGS are completely ignoring equivocal saying you know what go for it you're alone 1v1 don't lose your lane. He's winning, thankfully, for them. And they're just focusing all their efforts, all their efforts, on Vayne. They have, they have tried to gank mid maybe once. They've constantly shown up, counter-ganked or ganked the bot lane. That's the entire strategy here for SGS. It's working so far. And, and you know, they're... The, the team is making Lilai win the lane. Yeah, but they're looking for another couple of kills down bot. Lilai just forcing them back, and Greg is trying to get in range. He has his ultimate. He hits him. Bebe going down even through the Lulu ultimate. Lilai still chasing after mistake, gets another kill, and then backs out of their last second. Another double kill for Vayne, but in the mid lane, equivocal. He's 2v1ing toys and <laughs> little balls right now. Can he turn around and get little balls? It's very, very close. He throws out the undertow and backs off. Wow, and that's when you know you're in a rough situation here. So much gold. Onto Equivocal, so much experience, level 13, 
and he is just crushing people. And that's the difficulty, by the way, of, of itemizing for your lane. Toys has a lot of magic resistance and a bit of ability power. He's stacking magic pen to try to be a good assassin, but he's fighting physical and true damage with almost zero bonus health. Yeah. There's not much you're going to do against Equivocal in that situation, and and that is that is what is going to strike fear into their hearts. Oh, is Equivocal's not getting stopped, and he gets a War Mogs as well, which is incredibly scary because I don't know that TPA has the damage to take him down in these fights right now. They certainly and don't. What what's going to happen is SGS. They have a team that's particularly uh, well suited at diving into the back line of TPA with Nocturne and then Olaf running back there as well, and that's going to pull a lot of pressure off of Vayne. And then you know Vayne also has the support of Gragas and Tarek. So it's just it's going to be very difficult in these fights uh, for TPA to just make the concerted effort to take down Vayne. Um, you know Diana and Shen they could, and Mundo could try and jump in, but I, I don't think it's going to be enough for uh, to shut down my life. I mean, they, they have a chance of doing this as a thing because they have no really good save me supports. You don't have yeah. like a Nunu Absolute Zero. You don't have a Lulu or a Janna or a Sona who's going to crescendo. You've got a single target stun and a 30 armor aura. Yeah. That is the only thing really. Uh, and unless Ch sorry, unless Chawi saves his ultimate as a disengage. Right now he's been using it as a gank tool pushing Corky back into the team so Vayne can pick up kills. He can save it to push away Diana, push away Stanley, push away uh, Lil Boss, and then it's fine. Th then they can really just play the Vayne show and have her run around but and kill things. When they're sitting on the defensive because of Olaf and because of Nocturne, that, you know, is still going to be making things very difficult for them. Yeah, because then in that case, Chawi just knock one guy back in. He's landed every explosive cast I've seen yeah. so far in this game. He tried to fight toys earlier on, didn't get much out of it, but he's had two successful ganks with Perfect, perfect explosive cast. The first one gave them a double kill by knocking both Mistake and BB back. That was great aim the second time. Again, he caught BB. Uh, so, you know, as far as Chawi is concerned, uh, I think he's going to keep hitting those great explosive casts and going to keep picking up kills because of it. Yeah, and now they have the great sieging potential of Gragas underneath that mid lane, just slowly wearing them down. Lilith still up top. Stanley, you know, trying to duel with him. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you just see, they, they can't lane against Vayne right now. He's just so strong. But Corky, Bebe, he's actually coming up. He might try and pick off uh, um, Lilith here. He oh, was moving up. Off. Yeah, looks like everyone backs off instead. Nice attempt, though. Anyway, for a quick build recap, I always like to give this out to players. Equivocal, maxed undertow, then reckless swing. Vicious strikes. The W is up last for him. They're running back, making sure we're not missing a fight here. Chawi, of course, uh, maxing uh, barrel roll and then drunken rage. He's actually leaving uh, the body slam for last. There, you don't really get much out of ranking it here. Want to check out Lilight? Lilight is going for that very popular Max Silver Bolt's first yeah. build, where you rush the Phantom Dancer. That's worked well for him as well. And a lot of times in the past, you would see Condemn being max first for that cooldown. But yeah, the damage you get from the Silver Bolts is just absurd, and that's been yeah. the popular build now. Yeah, and they just rely on attack speed because even if you do get shut down, Vayne often has that rough landing phase. As long as you get Phantom Dancer and Silver Bolts, you'll scale okay into the game. Uh, Lil Boss, he maxed the uh, the Burning Agony, and then of course the Cleaver is second up for him. And those are the main builds that are they're a little bit that might be a little bit atypical here. Yeah, but we'll see what TPA can uh, do in this situation. But it's it's really interesting because uh, SGS they've you know been putting on a lot of pressure and they they perfectly banned out. Toys' best defensive uh, AP carries, and um, you know that's really allowed them to take you know this early lead in this game, and it's it's really significant. I mean, it's it's a 5k gold lead, but you know just how far ahead Vayne is, and uh, how far behind a couple of the members are on you know TPA can't be understated. There is a slight CS advantage in a couple of the lanes. Yeah, uh, you know. Um, Corky, he has a slight advantage over uh, Vayne, but actually the rest of them are in SGS's favor. And the one thing I want to point out is, is while SGS is in the lead here, pushing towards is a bit difficult for them. They're relying on poke primarily to get the opponents out of out of the way, uh, and and you know relying on, on having such good positioning that you know Shen's not here, Corky's not here, they get free damage in the turret. This will be theirs, but. It, for the most part, if, if everyone is grouped up for Taipei Assassins, it's not that easy for Singapore Sentinels to pick up turrets here. Now that they've killed all the outer turrets, it's much harder to get you know deeper into the base and get, get more and more turret kills. Now, with Singapore Sentinels being ahead, they want to provoke fights. They want to be in battle as much as possible because they'll tend to win these fights over and over. But there's nothing easy for them to bait here. It's too early to get a clean Baron that a gank would actually hurt them very, very badly. And Taipei Assassins won't pick a fight at Dragon. And so Singapore Sentinels need to find a way to catch them in the open field to, to kind of push their lead forward. They don't have great turret pushing in general, I feel.
Yeah, and, and then later on, so SGS right now, they need to be winning fights. Like every fight they win, they're going to want to take an objective. But uh, later on, if they make a mistake anywhere, then the Lulu-Diana combo is just so strong. And we've seen that in the past that, um, you know, that could just shut down SGS in fights if the game goes long enough, if TPA comes back in any sort of manner. So, you know, that, that could be really scary for them. And, and this is a team, those Taipei Assassins, who are very, very good at catching. We called this out in the very beginning. But as far as finding a guy and killing it, Taipei Assassins has a great lineup for it. Toys can initiate with Lunar Rush and a Moonfall. Stanley falls up with the Shadow Dash. You got Cleavers coming in from Little Balls, the Glitter Lance from Mistake, the knockout from her ultimate. Uh, we saw that from uh, Team Sulamid against uh, Azubu Blaze last night, where they were just able to pick out kills with Diana over and over. They had her uh, just charge in and just find a kill. That's very, very relevant. And, and Singapore Sentinels needs to make sure that they don't fall victim to that kind of situation. And yeah, particularly as he is getting deep into his build with that spell pen, uh, you know, once he gets a little bit deeper, um, if he gets like a Zonius, that can make things really difficult uh, for them. But uh, they're being very aggressive, trying to go, you know, push into TPA's base and, uh, you know, see if they can catch anyone off guard. So taking the bottom turret and then taking control of this jungle, they can maybe pick this up here. TPA hopefully doesn't just walk into that. Well, they are certainly grouped up back and forth. You, you can see the wards uh, does reveal Singapore Sentinel, so TPA will make the mistake. They try to catch BB. I don't know if they're going to go for it now. He's going to Valkyrie away. That's going to be safe. And they're just going to go for the back door on this turret. This seems a bit risky. Stanley, oh, he gets the taunt on Achawi. Achawi trying to get away, but they're going to dive in on this one. It's going to be painful. The front line is taking as much damage as they can. Everyone's going to back off here from Singapore Sentinel's low balls. Will they go for the cleaver poke? He's chasing down. He'll slow down darkness. They're going to dodge the barrels best they can. Low ball's still running forward. Their AD carries a little bit far to the back, though. But it's interesting. Lila, in this situation, a lot of the you know strongest veins in the world, when you see them play, they would uh, be using this opportunity to deal damage as they're on the retreat. But Stanley gets the flash. He gets the taunt. Hallelujah in a dangerous situation. He is going to go down. And TPA can turn this around. Toys, he actually gets the pullback on Chai as well. They can maybe clean this up. And they're going to keep on going. Two kills so far. Now BB, and it's equivocal. Can he get all the kills? He's got a shield from Shen. No, equivocal. Force completely, completely away. Uh, two for nothing. TPA cleaned that one up beautifully. And that also kind of partially goes back to the nerfs to Gragas not that long ago because Gragas using his ultimate for some harass onto Corky just to bully him off the lane so that they thought they could just go straight for the turret. And even with that massive gold lead, with that ultimate down and it's a you know much si significantly longer cooldown, it didn't get back up in time for that fight. And so you saw SGS, even with that gold lead, they were scared of TPA and they, they just ran in fear. And that is it allowed TPA to bully them around in that situation. Then you saw uh, Lai Lai uh, for a period of time, if, you know, Olaf in particular would tank for him and if they would uh, hold that front line, he maybe could have gotten some damage there, but not really attacking anyone the entire time. They were just running for their lives the entire fight. Yeah, that does surprise me a bit because an open field fight is kind of what, kind of what Singapore Sentinels want. Yeah. The difficulty though is, of course, without Gragasol, again, as you mentioned, you know, they don't have that peel. They don't have that ability to keep the important targets alive. Uh, you know, in isolation, that 5v5 would have been great for Singapore Sentinels, but again, Taipei Assassin's the team that can catch anything and just run at people, and they finally found the one kill they needed. That's, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's exactly right. It's exactly what they needed. Uh, a fight without the one big peel ability. And that could definitely snowball them back in this game. Little Ball's confident enough to grab an Oracles, and uh, I guess he's had it for a while, but he's really not deep into his build at all. I mean, Mundo, he has enough damage early on, but uh, he needs to get fairly tanky, and so it, it seems they're comfortable with just stalling right now. They don't know. Th they know that they don't have to force fights at this point in time, otherwise it would be really key for Mundo to grab uh, any of those early items, but also a couple of early item pickups for Mundo, just, you know, nice, cheap, efficient items uh, help keep him in this game. The Double Doran Shield is something we've seen become more and more popular on Jungle Mundo. It gives you, you know, of course, a lot of armor and health. Yeah. Uh, one of the actual difficult things about Mundo is that uh, not only is he burning his health pool while he's jungling, which is why the regen is so important on that, but also it takes a while to get the really big ticket items. The reason he tanks is because he gets a percent of his max health back over like 12 seconds through the ultimate. But unless you're actually tanking to survive those 12 seconds, you'll just die in the right. fight. And so you need some cheap durability, you know, as you mentioned, to actually keep keep yourself relevant for those fights and here we go they've got the Gragas ultimate up this is the fight that SGS wants to bait they've got good ward coverage they are going to go for Baron here 
Yeah, and if TPA groups up and the river is a perfect opportunity, they could, uh, Gragas could maybe get a perfect ultimate here. Lil Ball's just zoning them off. They're completely split as a team right now. If TPA tries to get an engage, uh, Lil Ball's trying to get a you know zone there with the cleave. But that was kind of a dangerous situation for SGS because they were trying to sneak it with uh, two members mid to you know throw TPA off. But if TPA had done a hard engage on the Baron pit, then you know they might have been able to pick up a couple of kills there before the fight even started. Absolutely, and that is the one thing that that's again just over and over so good for Taipei Assassins is they're going to be better at picking their fights. It's going to be pretty difficult for Singapore Sentinels to push people off of turrets without risking major cooldowns. Oh, and and they're just going for it full as a team. They yeah. don't even want to risk these pickoffs. Well, Toys went for that, that steal on blue, and it gave them some time. The difficulty is that they don't see this ward right here. The pick ward doesn't see it. They can't bait anything. They've got the Oracles of Darkness, but he hasn't actually shown up and spotted it. So this SGS can't bait anything. There, there's yeah. literally nothing they can do until Darkness runs into the and Baron And he doesn't pit. realize. He doesn't realize. But he's going to see it now when he walks in. They're going to be like, oh, wow, we got to get rid of that. And TPA, they have the awareness now. They drop the ward. SGS now backing off. They're actually still going to bait it. And Little Balls, he gets vision of them fast enough so that they can chase them out and know that they have control of this Baron once again. And this is going to be key. This is a really, really, really important fight. If SGS wins this fight, they get Baron and they probably control the game completely. Taipei Assassins, they, they become the bullies on the map if they Look win the, the next battle. Spot. There's oh, a wow. massive wave pushing in, in their turret. Uh, it's not going to be able to take it down, but it's going to harass it a little bit. And, you know, they've already... Um, you know, lost a turret up top from that minion push. So, uh, you know, the push is into the TPA space, and they don't have the opportunity to respond to it because they have to be concerned with this <laughs> quick Baron from SGS. Lowballs almost got cut out. Actually, with Lowballs recalling they're back, they know two people are in the base. I don't think SGS can stop this easily. TPA uh, can't. They're not. They're they don't have a near spike them. nearby. I don't see this ever being a good steal for Taipei Assassins. They're going to poke in, look for someone to get low. Stanley might try to steal just because. Heck, why not? A great old Olaf gets it. Stanley forced to run away. Oh, but a couple of them are low from Toys. Toys flashing out of there. It's a dangerous spot. Equivocal zoning off three members of the team. And Toys almost taking down Darkness. But Vayne's in a perfect situation here. There's the Lulu ultimate. If they can take down Lilai, that would be great. But it's just Little Balls versus the two of them. Lilai forced to flash out. TPA's actually turned this around. And Bebe in a strong spot. Chai actually split from the team. But Lilai zoned off from Little Balls and Lulu. And now they can maybe take him down. Oh, yeah. He's going to get jumped on by Corky here. Goes for a little bit of damage. Won't get much. Three for two. That fight did tip. Definitely go in Taipei Assassin's favor. They got the engagement they wanted, bought enough time until their team could arrive. But at the very and, and, and again, that was Chawi popped his ultimate to push Stanley into the team. Yeah, he eventually killed off Stanley, but suddenly the, the big cooldowns, the important spells, they're gone. Vayne could get caught and it kind of started collapsing in. And I'm honestly really surprised that SGS in the 2v2 or 1v2, uh, they weren't able to peel for Vayne because three members of TPA were stuck on Equivocal. Like, they were all focusing on Equivocal on the other side, and so it was just Lil Balls and Lulu taking down uh, Vayne, essentially. Uh, yeah. Diana was there as well at the beginning, but, um, you know, really, like you said earlier, uh, if, if they're not, you know, organized, if they don't have uh, force TPA on the defensive with Olaf and with Nocturne, then they just, they can't separate Vayne enough in these fights, and they were able to run her down. Yeah, the one thing I want to point out is is that they focus so hard on trying to kill toys. We saw Equivocal and Darkness and, and even LY4 a little bit trying to dive in and pick up the kill onto toys, but toys bought so much time that Darkness was killed off, and then out of nowhere, it will, okay, well now you've got Equivocal kind of alone in the middle of three enemy champions. They got toys, but they traded two for it. Gragas, Chowie, he went off and just chased out Stanley. He right, ulted as him, opposed to chased staying with Vayne. Him. Exactly, he chased him through. He picked up that kill, to be fair, but... Stanley's not the important target here, right? The purpose of a tank is to draw aggro and, and, and you know, basically tank that damage for his team. And here's Chawi not helping dive on toys, not helping get rid of BB. BB, right, he wasn't the one chased down. They were diving just toys. BB got free attacks. They were diving just Stanley. BB got free attacks. Meanwhile, LY4 actually getting pushed out by the tanks kind of properly. TPA's team fight was just better there. Like you said, uh, they were really focusing on getting toys, and Lilai was as well. And so you, SGS kind of, they thought they had won that fight. It was a really great situation for him. And then Lilai, uh, you know, going into the bush, he goes into melee range with Diana and Mundo. And part of it is that he doesn't have, you know, the best peel. But it was, it was was he could have stayed back a little bit, but it was because he was trying to chase down toys and secure that kill that he walked into him. Yeah, and, and, and that's going to be, you know, really scary overall. The, the, the cool thing, though, for Singapore Sentinels is they are getting quite a bit tankier. We finally have some resists yeah. bought onto Equivocal. He went health, health, 
Okay, now he's got a, a, a Warden's Mail, which is going to be a bit better in a situation where BB's going to keep swinging at him. That health pool is going to go uh, a lot better for him. We see Aegis completed, Riggles, and now a Giant's Belt. Looks like it's going to be Frozen. It could, it could be Warbox, it could be Frozen Mallet. Those are my two guesses here for Darkness. Onto Noctis. I guess Frozen Mallet for the slow. Um, and so you've got a tanky frontline that can really push down on the BB. BB has no durability stats here. I don't think life steals enough to keep him alive, so they can actually push him out if they go for that Corky. But meanwhile, you're seeing a Negatron Cloak and a Guardian Angel on uh, SGS's Bane, that's LY4. And he's gonna stop being afraid of Lil Balls at this point. He can happily tank almost any one versus two and fight through it if anyone even if anyone's even remotely there to help to keep him alive yeah, this is a poke game if a baron this should be good he has a lot of survivability now which is going to be scary but baby is actually in a good situation toys trying to force this and stanley with the follow-up yeah it's that way taking a lot of fun you can see him still surviving though probably getting pushed back no one's actually dead the initiation just gave epa a ton of uh free damage and immediately sgs now trying to run away toys he's going to find chow does not have moonfall up yet though they won't quite pick this one up. They're still trying to chase. Lilbaugh's flash cleavers for Darkness. Is that going to be enough for them? Toys, will they get any more initiation? Another cleaver lands. Darkness trying to run. Will not spell shield. There's the Moonfall. Catches on. So many people there. Toys with the Zonias. Terrick goes down. They're going to try to pick up more kills here. Oh, and Bebe cleaning up. Toys still chasing him down. But Bebe has that damage now. Equivocal trying to turn back into the team. But he can't take him by himself. A double kill for Bebe. The... GA actually popped for Lilai Toys, not going to chase him down after that, but it's a perfect situation. Charlie, the double dash, he's able to pick him up, and then the flash to not be condemned into the wall. Toys he did barely surviving, the and then Bebe coming over Lilai. Lilai can put it! Down. Bebe he does. down as well, the double kill for uh, Lilai in that situation, but still a really strong fight for TPA. The problem is, though, that this gives Taipei Assassins about 30 seconds to push down the base. I don't think they're... They're going to lose this turret. They There's could no be afraid question. of Nocturne. Yeah, look at the turret. I think they'll leave before Inhibitor, though, because Nocturne... Nocturne has his ultimate. If they stay more than this eight seconds, he'll go for one of them. He can one-shot Mistake. Mistake's ult is down. He has flash, but Nocturne can chase through a flash. Yeah, and that could instantly turn it around for another uh, for an inhibitor for SGS. So they have to watch out here. Yep. Tarek actually coming in. He gets right into the team. He pops that Shirelius, and here's the two of them. They're trying to go for that inhibitor. One more attack from Little Balls. He's going to be able to take it down, and they are too tanky for them right now. Darkness still trying to chase, but it seems they're almost out of there. The Q does land for Darkness. Little Balls off on the side, but Mistake is going to go down, but the damage has been done. The question is, can Little Balls get out of there? Because if he d goes down as well, those death timers are going to be brutal for TPA right now. And there's no time. Like Baron won't respawn uh, anytime soon, honestly. Uh, that would otherwise be a great chance for them to actually push in. They're going to try to find low balls, to be honest. And this might be the opening again if they catch it. The stun. Such a long cooldown, though. 12 seconds here. Nocturne coming from the side. He'll get the fear tether. Low balls, they're not going to go for it. They know. Yeah, there's Toys and BB coming in from the bottom trying to stop them out. Wow, and all in all, they were just way too tanky for them to take it down. And so you see, I mean, all of the damage on their team is basically vain. Gragas, you know, has a decent amount as well, but um, just not being able to eat through those Lulu shields and, you know, those natural tanks. So, um, yeah. you know, TPA turning this around. It's a 3k deficit right now. It was like an 8k gold lead for SGS, and now TPA has the inhibitor, and that's like the switch. Now they're in control of the game. Even though it's a gold deficit right now, they're, they're in control, and that's that's a really scary prospect. They are in control of the game, and what this really means is they can make good stabs at the two uh, outer turrets left up here. This turret right here at the top lane, which actually they're looking to move for right now, and of course this one at the bottom lane. Those are the those are the next points of focus here for Taipei Assassins. Baron's not up for a while. Looks like Dragon's got some time for it as well. Uh, but with Taipei Assassins kind of controlling the map, I feel, you know, they can get themselves a little bit more gold overall and make those happen. We actually see Singapore Sentinels ping that bottom lane. That turret is a bit low. The minions worked it down to half. That might be their, their set of focus if they do win a fight. That's what they're going to go for. Yeah, but TPA right now, they know if they force a fight in the next minute and a half, they're going to be in a great situation because Lila's GA is down right now, and they've uh, slowly made it come back here. And Corky in the previous fight, even though he doesn't have those defensive sets, he has the damage now. The Shirelia is being popped, trying to chase them down, but TPA pops one of their own, and they're able to get out of there. Uh, or actually, no, it doesn't pop. They don't have the Shirelias, but uh, they're able to back off in that situation. And y you saw uh, the previous fight, no damage onto Bebe. He was able to just mow them down because Toys w had SGS on the defensive. They were just so scared of Toys chasing them down that, you know, the rest of TPA was free roam. And I'm so surprised at this, too, because you've got a classic sort of dive buddies composition. Olaf and Nocturne will just absolutely run at a guy and not be stopped until they get there. And yet, Corky is completely unafraid. BB is building his... his 
fourth Ooh. offensive item here of Phantom Dancer. Bane's going bot right now. So Shen, Stanley, he's split pushing bot, and Lila's coming down to defend against him, which means that it's a 4v4 at Baron, and if Stanley gets out of there, this is their advantage right now. I think Bane's gonna get that kill for free, but in the meantime, we've got this 4 on 4 going on. They're trying to run away. With BB being there, it's a huge advantage. Equivocal forced to run away, getting chased, and that is so much damage. For them oh, to lose uh, yeah. Lilai in that situation is just brutal. And Stanley, he still has his flash. So he's just baiting Lilai away right now. Lilai's flash isn't up. It's going to be up in a second. He gets the taunt out. And so Lilai wasted so much time in that situation trying to chase him down. Uh, yes, he forced away Shen, but AD list team versus an AD team with Diana as strong as she is. They had no chance in that situation, yeah. and that just gave TPA another advantage to come back in this game and take the lead from SGS. Yeah, that was brutal. And now I know why they sent Vayne is because she can actually stun or at least knock back and yeah. break the channel on uh, on Shen's ultimate. And that's the difficulty of picking someone like Olaf is that he cannot interrupt. He cannot interrupt the Shen United from Shen, and so they had a they had a five v four no matter what. And there's complete control over Baron. SGS moving down there, but it won't matter. That Baron's going to go down 45-55. The respawn on that, TPA have complete control here. Yeah, and it's wild. This game, it seemed almost out of reach of TPA. I mean, they, they still had, you know, the great strength of Diana to always look forward to. But um, it was partially, SGS seemed a little bit afraid in, uh, of TPA. Even when they had the goalie, they hesitated in some situations, and it's allowed TPA to get back into this. But SGS, they still have a phenomenal late game if they can organize their fights a little bit better. Because the issue is, TPA has been uh, taking advantage of SGS every single fight. They've been, you know, running in fear or out of position in all of these previous uh, matchups. And, and the difficulty is is they don't I feel like they just they've run out of tools to use in the in the team fights. Equivocal, uh, you know, Jack talked about this in, in the TPA uh, or sorry in TSM versus Azubu Blaze and they talk about Dyrus uh, and Captain Jack where, you know, early on Olaf becomes a big menace and he's gonna push down people and, and he's really scary. But what it comes down to is when you get to the point where the AD carry can beat Olaf. And at this point, BB is is better than equivocal. You look at their gold and BB's at 15,000 to 12,000. You just look at that item build and you're like, it's a scary Corky. Yeah. They don't have the tools to dive Corky anymore. They've got to like pretty much run and face plant into each other and just like try to break down the front line faster than TPA can do that on the other side. I don't know if they can do that. You see TPA bullying their way in. They have the Baron. They grab the inhibitor again, even through the respawn. And uh, it's just, it's really difficult for SGS in this situation because Lila is not getting off consistent damage in these fights. Um, you know, he's, I, I honestly, I can't think of a fight. Uh, you know, he started off with a massive goal lead. I can't think of a single fight in this game where, you know, he's been comfortable in the back line uh, just auto attacking, which is what you need to see from Vayne. You need to just see those, those constant barrage of hits. And Absolutely. now TPA deciding to split push and, you know, Stanley, uh, who are they going to lane against him again? Because clearly if they lane Lilai, that's a GG almost for TPA. They send Olaf here. Olaf can win the 1v1. You know, Shen, Stanley still does not have a whole lot of items himself and they need to make that 4 on 4 pretty dedicated here. Uh, honestly, I think that's okay for them to defend. They actually, they've sent Nocturne. I guess Nocturne yeah, can arrive across the map. It's a good choice as well, certainly. Um, and eh, he'll be okay. He's three and two, and he's got a, a good number of minions. Uh, but you're seeing, you know, the turrets are getting broken down. BB, he's so safe to swing it at, at structures from afar. He can always Valkyrie backwards. Equivocal with a bit of poke, but you're seeing Taipei Assassins really unafraid. They just wait for the next menu wave, and they walk right back in. With the Baron regen, the Lulu shields, and just playing out di uh, dodging them. They haven't been threatened by Olaf or Gragas at all in these situations. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, now it's a po point in the game where uh, Gragas, he's w really just dominant in the early to mid game. But he's, he was always kind of weak later in the game, which is why people you know shied away from him for a long time. Because teams, they tend to spread later on in the game. And then he's very cooldown dependent. He you know he still has a lot of utility. If you can hit a large portion of the team, his ults will, will do a lot of damage. He gets the attack speed slow on the AD carry, which can be huge. But you're seeing TPA with a perfect spread coming into this inhibitor. And Bebe is just completely safe. So Chai is almost you know, inconsequential at this point. Well, the one thing he can still do, though, is disengage for LY4. And the one thing I think you know is, is worth trying is, is absolutely splitting the team up and trying to pick someone apart. The difficulty is that Toys, Consonias, and the rest of the front line is really, really tanky. And no one else is going to get put out of position here. So it's very difficult uh, for that Gragas to make an easy fight.
Yeah, and now the Gragas all is down, and immediately Toysi engages the battle. Equivocal trying to chase down Bebe, but Bebe is perfectly safe in the back line. Nocturne getting on him as well, but TPA is turning this around. Hallelujah is going to drop Chai as well. TPA is going to win this fight. Lila is still trying to eat away at him, but not dealing enough. And the pullback, he's going to go down as well. The GA has popped. Gragas as well going down. Lila is going down. TPA is going to win this game up 1-0 in this series. And SGS, they're going to look for a way to come back coming in game number two. And that was beautiful orchestration. Taipei Assassins really putting on that show there. And to me, that was their team just being so almost elegant there, where you know they had a BP frontline who could dive in on you. Um, I actually, uh, back at Lone Star Clash, um, Scar made the comment that like if you pick Dr. Mundo early, it's a bit of a risk. Yeah. Because, uh, but he didn't, he didn't say because. Like, no one pressed him on it. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to him backstage yesterday, and I'm like, so at Lone Star, you said Dr. Mundo early is, is a risky play. Why is that? He's like, well, a lot of teams can beat it. The way you run with Dr. Mundo is you need to go all in and people need to follow you. Because yeah. all you do is run at things and just be tanky and then just, you know, smash your face into guys. Um, and you need a team that, that, can, that can do that as well. And if you fight against, you know, an Anivia comp or an Oriana comp or, you know, just a, a generally really good long range kiting comp, you're going to beat Dr. Mundo because he's going to get caught out. He's going to get separated by a wall or something like that. And then he's alone and you, you can just burn him down and it's okay. Uh, and the thing is, this Singapore Sentinels team is a smash your face into the other team composition. Mm -hmm. Vayne's going to sit there and swing at you. Tarek does not have any you know, meaningful poking tools. Gragas, his meaningful poke is going to burn his, his major ultimate. And, and again, Nocturne and Olaf are just big all-in champions. And Taipei Assassins are happy to go follow in with Shen, follow in with Diana. Corky can just keep swinging the entire time. And so this whole team comp from TPA complimented that Mundo. And, it, you know, it just, I think Mundo characterizes what that team is about, which is running forward, smashing your face in, and killing things. And you saw when it worked, it completely worked. That one fight at the bottom lane, down 9,000 gold, just run at them. Yeah, that was absolutely absurd because, I mean, TPA, just w even with that gold lead, uh, just running in, in fear. And, I, you know, I, I kind of would have to wonder, um, you know, if we were to see Double Lift or, you know, Wei Zhao or any of these other top 80 carries in the game, uh, you know, what that fight would look like. And if, you know, TPA or if SGS had just turned around mm -hmm. and engaged them, but slowly back away from them and yeah. just, you know, kite out Mundo, but Vayne constantly be dealing damage because you saw yes. in that situation, uh, Life 4, he wasn't attacking at all. You know, I, I don't know if I saw almost a single fight the entire game where he was comfortable in the back line attacking until the end. And by that point in time, you know, TPA just overran them. And yeah. so, you know, it was a really... Um, interesting situation i mean he he was great in the laning phase he was able to get those early kills in those small skirmishes but maybe not the most comfortable in those ma uh, large team fights and that's something that you know Vane, um a lot of people you know she can be the strongest ad carry in the world mm -hmm. but a lot of people just aren't comfortable playing with, with her and you know I'm, I'm assuming life or i mean he seems to be comfortable but he's good, as yeah. a team you know they weren't able to engage there and that's the interesting thing too is is one of the first big lessons you learn as an ad carry is is die last or just don't yes, die period right. but it, it is never Never worth diving the enemy team to pick up a kill because you are the biggest source of consistent damage output. When you drop, your team's damage just plummets. And so he's playing the mind frame of, okay, I will not die. I'm right. vain and I'm ahead. I can kill anything. And that, that's generally speaking true. Yep. If, if he's alive and there's a meat wall for him, he'll shoot at things and they'll all fall down. Uh, but you're right. You know, he he was a little bit too afraid. That that fight at the bottom lane, uh, where they're you know running through. He had lizard buff. Yeah. Right? He has a phantom dancer. He's got tumble. He's got condemn. Corky only had triforce at that point. Yeah. He was way ahead. Olaf had a war mogs. No one on TPA had the damage to take down Olaf at that point. No. And, and yeah, they they were too afraid to fight that there. I mean, they cut it out the Doctor Mundo, oh, which I think was kind of cool that you know they had him at you know right. three quarters health and then okay. Uh, but they could have turned around on that. They had, uh, I noticed that Nocturne would save his ult so yeah. much in team fights. He wouldn't use it just for the confusion factor, which actually I feel might have been useful. Yeah. A little bit just to make people maybe miss some skill shots or not be able to right click someone. Um, but he would typically not ult and not dive in too much. You know, I, I, I think they played a little bit too scared. And it's funny because I talked with Fnatic about their game against Taipei Assassins. And, you know, in the games where they were ahead so much, but refused to Baron ever. Yeah, and, and I asked him about it. I was like, why don't you bear it? It felt like there was like five situations you could have tried. And what they said was, well, we didn't want to throw it. We knew we were ahead. We knew if we just kept playing the same game, we just keep winning and, and win it. And even though we could bear in, that 10% chance they steal it is greater than the 10% chance they come back fighting st fighting straight up. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it worked for them, of course. But here's Singapore Sentinels. They, they didn't seem to make that really work for them. You and know, they, they kept 
well, we'll just keep waiting. We'll just keep waiting. And it, and it didn't pan out. And you kind of have to wonder if that Chawi ultimate uh, right before that fight was almost the mistake of the game. Because that, you know, that, that turned that fight around for TPA. And it didn't seem like it at the time. It's just that they pressed after it. So, mm -hmm. you know, he tried to use it to force Corky off the turret. They tried to just backdoor the turret. And, you know, you can do that a lot of times. But Tarek was tanking as opposed to Olaf, uh, you know, who might have been a better option. But Tarek's you know, definitely fine at that point sure. in time. He has a lot of armor. But having that ultimate down, uh, you know, they weren't comfortable turning around and that was the concern SGS was like I, I, we can't fight him guys you know my ult's still down yeah and uh, as a result TPA made an incredible comeback in that game I, I think you're right like the more you sort of say that you know guys let's not fight my ultimate's down it, it makes a lot of sense the problem is is they had actually forced Corky back. Yeah. He was he was a He wasn't good, with the team, he was, it was a, a five v four. Exactly. He was a screen width away from his team at all yeah. times. I mean trying to catch up at three hundred base move speed in a Trinity Force, it'll take you some time. And SGS was like, no, we're just, just gonna keep running backwards. And like you have a lizard buff vein. Like that guy if you chase something, he'll fall. So you you could you could pick a fight, deal damage. You know SGS is not gonna fight four on five without Corky. So they get free damage if they wanted it, and, and, and they didn't want it. And that was that was really, really unfortunate. You know, it's not, not the best situation for them. Should have the second game coming up. It that is going to be hosted, scary, yeah. though, because now TPA has a 1-0 lead, and SGS, that could have been their game. And if they had started off at a 1-0 start, you know they have to be kind of down on themselves right now. They showed they can hang with TPA. They showed that they're a strong enough team early on in the game. Uh, you know, they were able to make some of those plays where TPA was the aggressors, and then all of a sudden, SGS turns it around and Chawi roaming. Uh, they just need to finish. And mm -hmm. you have to consider that TPA now, as one of the best teams in the world, arguably the best, and, you know, they really proved it at the Season 2 World Championships, which is just an incredible tournament. Um, you know, coming into the second game, they're going to be ready for SGS, and they're not going to, you know, fall behind early. It was the same thing against Fnatic. Uh, game number two, they didn't allow themselves to fall behind early. Uh, they were able to shut down Vaden early on. It's just that as the game progressed, Fnatic turned it around. So it's, it's, it's going to make it a lot more difficult for SGS to get that early lead in the second game. Well, and the cool thing is, you're right, because because the reason they did so well early on was, you know, rampant and amazing counter ganks. Yes. I mean, they read Taipei Assassins so well. And it's the thing I see teams do when they're the underdog, is they put in such great research to the opposing teams that they are able to predict the early moves. You, know, you saw it, you, you saw the Teleport Katarina, you know, reading out the uh, the Twisted Fate ganks uh, from Fnatic. You're yeah. seeing, you know, Darkness, you know, every single time he knows, oh, Toys is moving here, oh, Little Boss is coming here. And they're able to, to read all these moves. Yeah. And, and, you know, top teams, you know, the, the, the highest, the highest, the highest teams, they don't have, honestly, I feel like that same luxury. They don't get to snipe other teams. They have to make sure that their game is strong and that they react and they have to be sort of more like fluent in the game where someone like SDS will happily research an opposition uh, and, 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 and kind of snipe someone because you know, that one big victory uh, is 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 difficult to grasp. So they'll they'll all in for like a victory here and, and move just you know that one inch forward in the bracket. Um, and and so yeah, I think Taipei Assassins are going to sort of realize that they're getting read a little bit. That, that the moves they're making are are getting spotted. They're getting mm -hmm. counteracted. And they've got to be a little more cautious. I mean, uh, you know, again, all these kills were counter ganks. Yeah, right? they they were them. Oh, yeah, we'll get a yeah, kill it's here. Happened early in the tournament. Oh, it's too. darkness. Yeah, exactly, and that, that's where a lot of these comebacks are coming from. Uh, and then what you see as the game goes on is, well, now we're in end game, right? And, and end game is end game. There, there's no special sniping you can do. Everyone plays it. Uh, I mean, they play it differing, differing degrees. Uh, Counterlogic Gaming Europe. I talked to them about their end game strategies, and uh, and Carpo said it's it's funny. Um, it's it's surprisingly simple the things that you can do that work. He said, one thing that we do is we'll send a guy to each, you know, top and bottom lane and just like hit the melee minions once and then go back to mid because your minion wave will start to win. Oh, and it'll start it killing stops, the minions down. Rather than just killing the wave, yeah. it freezes the, the wave and allows a second wave to pile yeah, on. That exactly. Instantly, yeah, that's really smart. It piles up, it piles up, piles up. You get about four waves and they crash in the turret and all you do as a team is go five people mid and poke and be very aggressive. Uh, and you won't take the fights because you're relying on, again, a minion push to happen, but you actually play and this, this game where you, you, you keep them in yeah. mid. That's interesting because a lot of people, um, you know, you'll just kind of go up, clear the lane, and it pushes in, and it's, it's not really a big push, but um, that's kind of deceptive because, you, you know, on the defensive team, you look up and it's no big deal, but we've seen that a lot in the past uh, where, you know, like CLGU versus Moscow 5, they had the incredible comeback a couple of months ago. It was like a 30k, you know, deficit, and they just stalled mid with a Nivea, and then those crashing waves, you know, they don't seem like a lot at first, but uh, the longer you're stalling there, it really pushes in. But I honestly, I think TPA... 
um, some of the mistakes we've seen coming in from them have been when they've been trying to be the aggressors in these tournaments. Mm -hmm. And like you said, teams have been reading them. But I think they are the best reactionary team in the world. If they sit on the defensive, if they can get toys on something he's comfortable with, um, you know, then they can uh, respond to anything and turn it around. But if they ban out those defensive AP carries and he has to play an aggressive AP carry, then that forces TPA onto the offensive. I mean, he uh, was which Diana, is, you know, normally really strong. And yeah, he was Diana. I mean, he was like, I don't completely like the read of that TPA is not aggressive because I think that the, oh, they're, they're the, definitely aggressive. Okay, I'm just saying when they're on the defensive, when they play a reactionary game, they do play well defensively. Uh, you know, that was what we saw throughout the season two world championships. A lot of times they would uh, play uh, reactionary, and they, they are a very aggressive team. They mm -hmm. they constantly force uh, team fights early on, but when they're uh, responding as opposed to initiating, um, you know, it, it seems like they can take advantage a little bit better. Yeah, and it does depend on the teams a little bit. And, and the, the, of course, the champions he plays the most, right, the ones he's most famous for, like Karthus, Oriana, uh, and Anivia, those are almost better defensively. You, yes. you don't start fights as Karthus. Right. You waddle in there, turn on a file, everything falls over for you. Uh, and, and Anivia and Oriana are the same way. It's much harder to start fights as them than it is to like, oh, they're running out of shockwave, you're all stuck together. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'll give you that. A lot of the, a lot of the favorite champions there uh, do tend to lend to that play style. So, okay, C case in point, you win. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I doubt it's, it's, you freak. It's, it's interesting like... because like the team fights are, are that way. But, yeah. but the entire like early mid game and laning phase, that's actually all characterized by aggression because yeah, you don't, that's true. you don't that's lose much to true. make a gank. Right, it takes you like 20 seconds to run over there, and you get like 600 gold for it with two kills. Well, 50% uh, for assists, so like 900 gold for it with two kills, which is a huge, huge, huge lead to get. Um, and well, you just look at little balls and toys, and they constantly force you know fights early on. Mm -hmm. And little balls, he's always been uh, that aggressive jungler. If it's Mundo, you know he's putting um, you know pressure on the side lanes and uh, in the jungle. But you know also in the past with Alistar uh, and Malkai, you know putting pressure on that mid lane uh, a lot and just looking for those yeah. early fights. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the way to do it, really. And, it, and it's nice to see, you know, just how the game sort of progresses from these top teams is, is they make plays as much as possible because, because that's how you get ahead is you make plays, realistically, you know? You saw that bottom lane was, was really brutal for Singapore Sentinels. They, they were losing, you know, Vayne Tarek against Corky mm -hmm. Lulu, and so they made plays. They right. showed up with Diana, or you know, they showed up with, with Gragas. They showed up with Nocturne. And it, they, they made a really a lot of great moves and got themselves ahead. And, and, and that's... The kind of things you have to do, right? And if, if you're trying to get into season three, or you're playing ranked teams, or you're just playing the game in general and trying to get better, mm -hmm. making plays is a really big deal, um, especially, especially um, because it works both ways. You can snowball lane ahead, and that's perfectly but fine. You can also go the way, uh, snowball behind. Yeah, and you yeah. and you can completely turn something around from behind because typically when you're behind, you're getting pushed on. It's near your turret. Well, they're more open here. And then at the same time, though, if you push them to their turret, you can surround them on their turret. There's a brush right there behind them. You can dive in through. Making plays is really, really important. Um, but the teams that are really, really good, they're spotting that. You know, we, we've talked about, because uh, we've seen so many lane swaps in the first couple of days, uh, where it's a 2v1 and the 1v2. Uh, and, and like the thing that happens always is like, they hit level three on both the top laners, right? And he's still level one. The minus crash on his turret, jungler shows up. And, and, and we saw, it was, it was, I think it was uh, one of the M5 matches uh, where... Diamond was sitting in the bush, yeah. waiting for it. He's waiting for it because he yeah. knows it's happening, right? It's right. like... And, and, and it's the and most common gank in the world when you have that 2v1 to come exactly. in behind the turret at that timing. Mm -hmm. and, and then, and then you, I even saw it progress since then where there was, I don't know if it was still M5, but he's waiting for the counter gank and he's like, I'm just jungling, dude. Because yeah. we know you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it balloons on itself farther and farther. Well, it's, it's funny. And that's, you know, what the good junglers do or they're, they're responsive. It's not, you know, that cookie cutter thing. Um, I remember seeing in the wild card, CLG NA versus Quantic. And as a, you know, just to show how Chalster is as a, as a jungle, they had that 2v1 matchup up top. And then uh, Hyle 9, he sat up top waiting for Chelster to come in. And he just sat and they, they you know, two man that lane. And I think part of it is maybe their top laner is not comfortable in that 1v2. So he needed a little bit of help to get through some levels. But he, Heil 9 just sat there, you know, waiting for that gank to come. And Chelster's like, is this a joke? All right, I'm taking your jungle. And he just ran down bot and took their entire jungle. And it happened uh, multiple times where, you wow. know, he would go up there expecting the gank and Chelster would be like, all right, dude, have fun. You know, I'm going to leave you there. So uh, we'll see what's going to go on. We will have TPA versus SGS uh, game number two in a second, guys. I'm really looking forward to it. Freak, it's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a really cool game. It's and I've, uh, I've had a lot of fun uh, yep. casting with you here. But uh, once again, guys, we like to really thank our sponsors. They, you know, There's a lot of people that really make all of this happen. Um, 
you know, Speedstick is one of them. Speedstick, they're a huge sponsor of uh, esports here and really want to, you know, bring IPL5 to all of you guys. So SGS don't sweat it, handle it. Exactly. That's the key to the game. SGS, don't sweat it, handle it. And you got to give a wink to the camera when you do that. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> don't sweat it, handle it. Oh, man. Or is it, is it wink at the end? Is it like handle well, it? it was, like, no, like a no, star no, comes because off? Because then it's like it's a joke almost. Oh, you wink no. at the end, then it was like, oh boy. <laughs> no, but that the <laughs> first one... The first one was the perfect wink. It was beautiful. Okay. You know, everyone out there is swooning right now. Handle it. But uh, thanks a lot, guys, for watching. IPL5, I, you know, we've all had so much fun here. Um, it's really an awesome event. And you meet so many cool people outside. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have the Origin PC promotion, which is really cool, guys. If, you know, by the way, I'll throw that out there. But, um, you know, I saw some guys yesterday uh, with the Origin PCs here. You can actually get the plate on the PC and run around and have people sign it. So they're running around, yesterday. you know, getting uh, players sign it. And you're just like, you just say hi and meet a bunch of people. And, mm -hmm. like, the whole crowd's going insane. There's, like, six people in the audience with Vuvuzelas. And you're, like, constantly <laughs> sitting off to the side, like, do we have to shut this down? Like, should we <laughs> tell them to stop? Nah, whatever. We'll let it go. Esports, man. We're loud. Yeah, but it's it's been a really cool event. I, I The one disappointment is I've been casting over here both of the times that the TriCast has been going on Aww. and I really want to check that out but I love you know casting these games because these are some of the best teams in the world and they've really been showing up this weekend it's it's really awesome I yeah. think it's wild well, if you compare IPL5 with IPL4 and the game styles that we saw that long ago that was a mostly NA tournament against Authority coming in not performing that well but everyone played really passive styles back then and it was I mean it was an NA tournament that was NA style 